So we're in beautiful, bouncy Barcelona for MWC25. I'm here with Greg McCall, Chief Networks Officer at the BT Group. Greg, thanks so much for joining us out of your busy schedule again. Great to see you. You too, Ray. Um, so let's get stuck into it. Um, what has BT learned from its initial deployments of 5G standalone? Yes, yeah, so I think first and foremost, Ray, um, you know, I think I should highlight how well it's going. Um, you know, we, we launched it about six months ago and um, we already have made it available to 21 million people. So almost a third of the UK population, um, which is pretty fantastic. And um, what we've seen is, you know, the, the kind of promise of 5GSA, we honestly believe that it is the bedrock of future connectivity. Um, but it's not, it's not been easy. It's been um, a, a long journey. We wanted to time it right when the ecosystem had matured. And I think we've done a good job of that. It was great to see Ookla calling us out as um, you know, building a fantastic 5G network. So that was really, really good and one of the leading networks in Europe. Um, but our focus has really been on how do we deliver a differentiated experience for our customers? And, um, and that really you know, focuses on three things. One is our cloud core that we spoke about last year um, is really coming to fruition because um, it gives us the flexibility you need for a 5G SA network. Um, a diversified spectrum portfolio um, and carrier aggregation has really meant that we can deliver that service that is better than the non-standalone service. Um, and then finally, it really is about ensuring that you've got some benchmarks around performance. Um, and that's where we've really led the way in the UK because we don't declare a town or city unless you get 95% outdoor coverage. And we think that's really, really important as people connect to our 5 GSA network. Okay, and have there been any surprises? Have you kind of, you know, learned stuff that you didn't expect or, you know, in the in those first few months? Because I'm sure there's obviously things that don't go to script one yeah. way or another, either good or bad. Yeah, I'm not sure they, they surprise us per se, because as you say, you expect um, a few challenges and we've had a few challenges. And I think what, what, what it really is, is about constant tuning and tuning the network from the core right through to the RAN and then even into the devices to make sure that you're constantly delivering that optimal experience for our customers. Because as I say, the only reason why we're doing these things is to deliver that differentiated experience for our customers. Okay, uh, and can you just give an example of that differentiation? What kind of new service has been able to be delivered as a result of this deployment? Yeah, so I think um, you know, in, in high capacity areas like Wembley Stadium, um, having a service that you can use. Um, so we've got an optimized slice at Wembley. Um, so even though there's 80,000 people, you still get the kind of service that you would expect um, if you sat at home or in a, in a more quiet area. Um, one of the things that we did speak about was the Belfast Christmas market, uh, where we had a slice for uh, point of sale applications. Right. Um, so even though it was a congested area, your transactions could still work um, seamlessly across our network. Okay. Um, so, uh, as we've already observed uh, very early on here at MWC, literally AI is being touted as the, the, the main thing that companies are looking to talk about and show off here at the show. Uh, but what impact has the, the surge in AI engagement had on BT's network architecture plans? What needs to be done to ensure that customers get a good experience if they're using, for example, multimodal AI? applications and uh, and we'll, in a minute we'll come on to your views of the AI RAM but what is that what is the surge in AI use meant for your the way you plan the network and the way you're thinking about the future network? Yes yeah, so I think for, for some time now we've been thinking about our network um, and thinking about how we delayer and disaggregate um, the network components um, really based around open APIs um, to ensure that we can uh, flex as and when um, different AI applications mature um, in the industry. So um, that gives us a great opportunity to be able to adopt things as and when they emerge. Um, so I think that's been really, really good. Um, but it is, it is a challenge because um, what we are seeing, it, we think about it through networks for AI and AI for networks. So, um, you know, I think Networks for AI, I think it's probably fair to say that it's still quite immature and we're not seeing a huge surge in data capacity on our network. And some of that could be substitutional, um, but right. you know, equally, I think the developer ecosystem 
are really incentivized to try and limit their bandwidth utilization so that they can get their applications out um, to customers wherever they might be using their services. Um, when we think about AI for networks, um, the big challenge there is really thinking about how we get all of our data into a single place so you can then start layering AI on top of that. Um, and you know, machine learning, automation, AI all come hand in hand, but it really only works when you've got good data. And um, yeah. that's been our biggest challenge. I think it's the challenge for the industry, you know, bringing all that data together and then layering AI on top of it. But yeah. you know, in, in BT, we're already using it um, to, to improve our operations, to improve our network planning, to improve our spectrum efficiency. Um, and then in our security op centers, uh, we started to use that to aggregate fault detection um, so we can get to, to challenges and problems quicker. Okay. And uh, AI ran, that's sort of quite a, been quite a hot top in the past year and certainly already at this year's MWC. Is that something as put forward by the AI RAN Alliance? Is that something that BT's looked at or thought about? Yeah, we're following it very, very closely as with all new tech. Um, as you know, BT you know, leads in innovation and we've got a fantastic research de um, you know, department that uh, you know, focuses on what is emerging. Um, I think that the key thing for us though is we've obviously invested significantly in the current infrastructure. Um, and AI RAN embeds AI you know, into the infrastructure. Um, so what we are working through is what are the challenges um, that we face and over the top AI compared to integrated AI, what benefits do you get from one versus the other? Yeah. Um, and you know, I think it's going to be an investment call rather than anything because yeah. um, as we said at the and an energy consumption challenge exactly as well. and yeah. um you know as we've said everything is tagged with ar these days so we've got to follow it closely and i'm sure there'll be benefit but right now our focus is over the top ar to think about how we use our data to improve the service we offer to our customers okay um and then still on the topic of uh, ai can you talk a bit more bit more about how the BT Networks team is, is using AI applications uh, and how close you think we are to what you could really call network automation as a result of, of using AI? Yeah, so I touched on it a little bit. Um, you know, I think that the first thing is we're trying to democratize the use of AI applications across our development community. Um, so, you know, we, we have Code Whisperer and other applications that's helping us to write code more efficiently than we did in the past. Um, so that's one use case. Another use case is um, uh, fault detection and aggregating those faults, um, which is much more machine learning um, than AI per se. Um, and then, you know, finally, I think we are, we've got this program that we call um, Data Driven Operations, so DDoPS. And what's really critical there is we've got a team of people looking at all of the tooling we've got, all of the data we've got, to think about the use cases where AI is going to help us solve problems far quicker than a human. Um, and that's really, really interesting because already we're seeing opportunities for us to do things in real time that you, we used to do post-processing. Um, and you know, especially in the RAN, that's starting to deliver great sustainability benefits, but equally performance benefits for our customers as well. Okay. And in terms of, you know, the, the dream of the automated network, um, are you sort of bringing that level of, or any kind of automation sort of bit by bit and trying it out in certain parts of the, of the network first? I exactly. You know, I think, um, I think the key thing is we've got to iterate and learn as we go. Um, and as we are layering these different processes and use cases on top of our operations, we're learning things and thinking about how we aggregate it. I think it's fair to say when you run a complex network like ours, you've got to be a little bit careful of going straight to automation um, yeah. because you don't want the AI to um, you know, hallucinate or do things that um, make the experience worse for our customers. So what we are doing right now is before we get to automation, we still have an operator who looks at what AI is recommending, and then um, we will move to full automation when we get confidence that its recommendations are always accurate. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Now, you've mentioned uh, APIs a, a few times already. Can you talk about BT's network API uh, strategy uh, and how that's progressing and, and what BT needed to do to enable network exposure to the application developers? You know, were there some concrete steps that needed to be taken to provide the, provide the foundations for, for API uh, development? Yeah, and you know, I think once again, uh, there's been a lot of talk about APIs more recently, but we've been you know, working with the GSMA since 2017, I think it was. Um, so APIs are not new to us. Um, in fact, you know, we've, we've been quite focused and we've got a number of APIs that follow the, the Open Gateway Framework and Kamara Framework. Where I see the real benefit is how do we standardize on those APIs? Yeah. So uh, you know, the developer community don't have to write um, their code for the BT or E network and then something different for one of the other networks. So that standardization is really, really important. Um, but I think um, for us, as I said earlier, we think about APIs being at the heart of what we're doing. And as we de-layer our network, APIs become even more critical, both for our internal operations, but if we're making those APIs available, why don't we make them available to customers as well? Yeah. And what we've seen is where we focused on the kind of customer pain points, we're already generating really, really good usage of those APIs, especially in the financial sector, um, to try and reduce the pain points for customers and make it more seamless for them. Okay. Now, we've already touched a couple of times on, on power consumption and energy efficiency. And, and while, you know, AI might dominate, you know, green networks are still a, a major consideration for pretty much everybody here. Um, but is the industry delivering what BT needs to better manage its power consumption and its networks? Yeah, I think it's fair to say, and we should, you know, we should compliment the industry. I think, um, you know, it may have taken, um, you know, the war in Europe for, for us and energy prices increases for people to really focus on it. Right, um, yeah. But over the last three or four years, there's been a lot of focus across the industry. And, um, you know, we are already seeing some of the benefits of that. So um, we are using cell sleep in our radio network, um, and that's saving a significant amount of, of energy consumption, which is great not only for the bank balance, but also for the planet. Yeah. Um, and what we're trying to do now is think about what other components in our network can we put to sleep when it's not needed um, and get really aligned on when there's capacity in the network and when there isn't capacity in the network and therefore turn off components as we go. So I think that's super, super important. And, you know, I've said it a couple of times, Ray, I, I truly believe that we are the last generation of technologists that can use technology to make a difference to our planet. Um, and it's great to see um, the industry wake up to it. It's great to see the collaboration that we've got. And um, certainly within BT, we've got ambitions to be um, net zero by 2031. Um, and I think we're making really good progress towards that. Okay. And I feel really proud that um, you know, as a team, sustainability is front and center of what we do. Okay, good to Good to hear that it still is there because a couple of years ago at MWC, you know, green was uh, everywhere as the messaging and then basically it <laughs> seemed to get shoved aside by AI. Exactly. A, I mean, that's the nature of marketing, I guess. It, it's absolutely, you know, I have, I have um, teenage kids and, um, you know, I think their buying habits are much more focused on, you know, what companies are doing for the planet. And, um, you know, I think it's going to become even more important and, you know, a, a sustainable green network, I do think customers will choose that over a non-sustainable network in the future. Okay. Well, I mean, let's hope so. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be good. Um, another thing that I'm expecting to hear more about this year than last year is uh, 6G, because there's some pretty important meetings coming up soon to start the kind of the, the real planning process. Um, are you factoring in uh, 6G into your network plans right now? And how involved is the BT Networks team uh, in the 6G planning processes that, that are upcoming? Yeah, I think as with all new technology, I think it's really important for us to embrace it, um, to work in collaboration around it. Um, and that, you know, we are involved in the standards bodies to think about how um, we evolve from 5G to 6G. I think the really important thing is we need to make that transition as seamless as possible um, because 
like us, the industry has invested significant amounts of money, time and um, sweat into building a 5G network. And, and I think we're still scratching the surface of what a 5G network can deliver um, for our customers. So, um, you know, right now we are following it, but I think it's some way off. Um, so it's not integrated into our network plans today. Um, we believe that 5G SA is the bedrock of future connectivity. Um, and therefore, we want to absolutely focus on delivering the best 5G SA network uh, before we get to um, 6G. So I think there's still a long road to run before we get to 6G. Okay. Uh, and then finally, sort of o over the years, I've very often asked people just to, to move away from the telecoms topic uh, briefly, what their favorite film of all time now. But that's starting to make me feel a bit old fuddy-duddy. And uh, so I need to upgrade my question. So Greg, I'm going to ask you, what are you streaming right now? Is there anything you could recommend to people out there to uh, to check out uh, in the streaming services? Yeah. So as you know, Ray, I'm not a I'm a bit of a sports nutter. So um, the things that I stream are, are usually sports related. Um, and I'm watching Full Swing Series 3 at the moment, which is the golf program. Oh, okay. um, and uh, it's pretty awesome, to be honest. So <laughs> I'll definitely push out for any of your golf enthusiasts listening to this. Um, get in and watch that. The first two episodes, the first two series were great. Uh, the third one's even better. Okay, excellent. All right, great recommendation, Greg. Thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us and have a good MWC. Thanks, Ray. Thanks very much. Good to see you. All the best.